Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, everyone, wherever you are on planet Earth. Uh, this is the Naughty Orty in Conversation. I'm Harry Thompson, the host, and today I'm joined by Demi Burnett. Hi, De Hi Demi. Hi. Demi Burnett is a reality TV star and mental health advocate known for her time on The Bachelor and Bachelor in Paradise. She made history as part of the first LGBTQ couple on the series and is passionate about feminism, as well as advocating for other women and oppressed groups. Demi now educates on her platform about her recent autism diagnosis, as well as sharing her love of fashion, animals, psychology and healthy relationships. Right, Demi, I'm going to kick it off with the question I traditionally ask first. How and when did you come to discover that you were autistic and PDA? Uh, I discovered that I was autistic, well, rediscovered it uh, this January of 2022, and I got diagnosed in February. But I had initially discovered it once I was a freshman in college. So right after high school, I was out on my own. Um, but it was uh, rejected by everyone I knew. Like, uh, there's a huge stigma and stereotype around it. So I kind of felt really embarrassed. And I essentially just, like, partied myself into forgetting all about it. And then I got sober in July of 2021. And after, like, six months of clarity, I realized that I had been autistic. And I, like, this whole time, I was right about it the first time eight years ago. And so I got diagnosed, but then I was like, I don't know if this completely makes sense to me. Like it kind of does, but it also doesn't. Like, I, I just don't see some of the other things that I see in um, the typical presentation of autism, like routines, repetition as much and stuff. But also there was like this other part of me that I had no words for of like this, I want to do nothing, but it's not do nothing. It's like, I can't do anything. And like, I felt uh lazy or something and then I read about PDA and that was right after I got diagnosed so I want to say like maybe March probably February end of February beginning of March of 2022 and then after that I spent all day every day all day every day researching PDA because like I am fortunate enough that I got on The Bachelor so I got to make my own career for myself after that thanks to my PDA charm and um so yeah i i got to spend a lot of time researching everything about it and talking to a lot of different people uh that know the most about pda and just yeah it was it was really crazy it was life changing i'm sure i'm sure so as I said in the intro, and as you just um, confirmed there, you were on a reality TV dating competition show called uh, The Bachelor. Uh, what was your experience of doing that? What was it like? Um, it was really fun for me. I I definitely was, I, I would have moments day of the- uh, All day, every day, researching. What was that? Sorry, that was you from the past. My page just refreshed itself. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay that was oh yeah. um okay what was, what did you just ask me yeah I'm, I was asking oh, what was it like the bad yeah thing. yeah so there was definitely moments where I uh, would get like uh and then those were the moments when I would drink like I would feel like extreme distress and like really 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 uh I didn't know like the right words to put for it but I would just be like oh, I just need to drink I need to drink so I use a lot of alcohol to cope with any of the times where I was feeling distressed and um then I also like I wasn't in the industry I didn't come from any of this like Hollywood was a dream and I was like from the country and stuff and so I for like back uh, lack of a better word like tone deaf like just not being able to read the room like uh, aloof like I was just having fun and like running around. And so um, they kind of played into that like naiveness of naivety that I had. And um, we made really great television with it because like I was just like innocent because like people would get mad at me, but it was like, what are you mad at? You know, she's not doing anything. She's just being Demi, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, so now I admittedly did not watch that show. Um, however- You're I kidding. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> However, I was wondering, um, did your autistic presentation, and you kind of touched on it then, um, did that become something of your um, your image? Did they capitalize on it? Was there anything derogatory or, uh, you know, were you kind of the eccentric, uh, you know, that kind of thing? Did you feel as an autistic person, actually you didn't know you were autistic then, did you? No, no, I no. did not. Uh, well, no. I mean, so I, I, guess I have known it. Mm. I guess, were you okay about the way you were portrayed? Did you kind of, um, was, was, did you think that perhaps maybe some of the viewers, some of the critics, uh, some of the producers maybe picked up subconsciously on you being autistic and used that as a kind of demi image? And was that a cool thing or was it uncomfortable? Um, I would say that, uh, that, that someone had to have known. I mean, I've met people within the franchise that have said, oh, I knew you were autistic the first time I met you. And I was right. like, wow, I wish you would have told me. Like, <laughs> but um, I think really kind of like the opposite of like being offended by how they portrayed me. Like while I was filming, I started picking up on like people getting mad at me because the confrontations and like, I felt like so uh, um, rejected by the cast, like, with while we were filming by the majority of them like I felt like they thought I was annoying immature childish which they all called me those things on tv so I was accurate to feel those way or to feel those ways and so when I was when it was aired it I was like the fan favorite so I was like this is this is what I deserve thank you because like while I was filming it they were so mean and not even mean but like shady like low-key mean and so whenever it was like, wow, everyone loved it. I was like, yes, you know, I'm so excited about it. But looking back on it, it's just like, wow, I have a lot of problems like with different ways of looking at it. Like, first of all, the people who were like, the, one, the, the women who like went against me or whatever, like that put them in a position of, like, I just don't like how that was all set up because in the producer's minds, like they knew that they were going to protect me. And like, I was the entertaining factor of the season. Like I, I mean, if you look on Amazon prime on my, on the season I was on, I was on six episodes, four out of the six, it's my face. Like they want you to know that this is where I am in these episodes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, like, you know, so that's, that's whatever. But then the women who went against me, it caused them to be like, essentially like my victims of like my demi, you know, character. And so then it limited their experience on the show too. all, because, you know, so it makes me feel icky about that. And then that's an injustice done. And it's like, I, I did not, I did not want that to happen. Like that doesn't, that doesn't sit right with me. And then also doesn't sit right with me that I didn't make any money off of that. And they're using my face. <laughs> but then again, they did build me a career, but also, I'm struggling to pay my rent. Here we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so you are from the South. And I wonder what it was like growing up in Southern culture as a PDA. -er. I have an interesting view on this. Um, I think that every, uh, I'm not going to speak for everyone. My experience is that there's an expectation for you as a woman in the South, as a little girl, you are a good girl. You are supposed to be a good girl. And what does a good girl do? She is quiet. She doesn't argue against anyone. She helps cook and she helps clean, take care of the house. She does good girl things. And uh, there's, she depends on the man. She depends on a man to be the breadwinner, be the, you know, maybe the hunter, the gatherer, or the hunter, whatever, if we're going to think about it that way. But there is no um, room for, like, as, as a woman, like, you can't ever embarrass or, like, make a man feel lesser than. 
um, and you feel made lesser than all the time. So like as a PDA or just like messes with your nervous system. And so like as a little girl, like, you know, I would point out the facts like innocently, obviously. And it was like punished for that. So don't speak up again. And also not only like don't speak up, like don't trust yourself. Like whenever you spoke up for yourself, and you were right, even like innocent little things. It was like you, I was made to doubt myself. So like that was um, a lot of the trauma of it is, is learning that and believing that like, I do know, like I, I'm smart and like, I'm making observations that are correct. Like, um, you know, just learning to believe in your own opinions and feelings and observations, but also like, um, as a pda I, I internalized all of this. Like I fawned. I knew that if I didn't, it was, <laughs> it was actual like punishment. So you fawn, you fawn, you fawn. So instead of doing things like acting out uh, defiantly, like for example, don't touch the electric fence, touching the electric fence. I didn't do that. I internalized it all. So instead, I was internalizing my own needs. So I was like pooping in the bathtub and doing things like that. And until I got into middle school and then I started to become argumentative and develop like an attitude. Um, but it was really from having to do all of these things I didn't want to do, knowing that I had to or else I would be um, in in trouble like that's the culture of the south like um i'm not sure that i'm probably the best one to explain it like uh i haven't i don't know the vocabulary for it but like in the south like you don't you don't argue back you don't say anything you just do what you're supposed to do you're you're supposed to be a good girl so i just started being argumentative started having this attitude started getting uh not accepted and like loved back by family like because I was bad and stuff and um mm -hmm. yeah it's just it's all just toxic and they what essentially what they wanted me to do was submit mm -hmm. to submit to conform I remember being told conform or you will never be happy and I, and so what did I do I got on a reality show I said I will never conform you were like ah I don't you know you would think just to submit would to be easier than to be constantly arguing um and fighting for your life all the time over little things um mm -hmm. it was just it was very difficult and so yeah I as a woman not very sought after because of the because I call people out but I don't mean to I don't do it viciously I don't do it to try to make people feel stupid I just do it because it just uh I don't know I don't I can't help it yeah. Do you think people knew that about you, that kind of autonomous streak that is driven uh, uh, towards justice and they tried to perhaps suppress it or squish it out of you? Yes. Yes. And especially with a uh, the, the reasoning being because of like a undying loyalty to family and stuff like that. Mm, that's complex. Very yeah much. and I never bought into it though like uh I knew how I felt and I was just like mm, no I'm not buying it I, I never bought into the Southern Baptist Church either like and I went there every Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night for like my whole life and so, no no yeah yeah I it, it never felt right it just I never it never did. And I mean, you can't, I, I didn't like want to not believe it. I didn't want to not buy into it. Like I really tried, but I was like, listen, I haven't, God hasn't said anything to me. <laughs> I mean, this actually enters into a special interest of mine. Um, all matters theology are very interesting to me. So um, what's it like objecting to um Christianity, Christian dogma within that environment. Uh, you said, I can't feel anything, I can't hear anything, it's etc. Um, what's the typical response to that? Pretend like you do, like without saying that, it's like 
it, it's like, well, it, it basically it's just trying to convince you in ways to pr essentially pretend like you do. I remember yeah. my grandma told me that uh, we were blue blood. We came from German royalty. And I was like, how, how do you know that? <laughs> and she said, Shh, just believe it. And I was like, oh my God, no, that like, y'all been spreading this for centuries, for generations. Y'all just been telling each other this lie. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so you kind of touched on this, but how did your trauma as a PDA develop? So you talked about fawning and then you said eventually it evolved into a more argumentative <coughs> stance. Um, because it is interesting with PDA. Uh, we have the PDA profile, we have the PDA essence but we are all from completely different backgrounds and it manifests completely differently and is large, well, our, at least our trauma presentation is largely influenced by our uh, cultural surroundings and upbringing. I, for example, um, was born into a relative wealth and therefore to not achieve and to not be productive uh, induces feelings of worthlessness and uselessness. So how would you say uh, that uh, panned out for you, that part of your life? So fawning, argumentative, did it do something else eventually as you entered your adult years? Um, yeah, uh, definitely the fawning and then being argumentative. Uh, it looks like, you know, passive aggressive at times or... Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Like I thought I had self-awareness, but I really, I was having so many reasons for what was happening and like kind of like excuses and like all of these stories about like all of my uh, actions and stuff. And it's all to justify the behavior without me trying, without me thinking I'm justifying it, if that makes any sense. Like you can, it helps me understand people who, can who might um be perceived as like really bad people or like narcissistic people and stuff like that like uh your brain can make you justify your actions where you think you're not doing anything wrong at all and it's really like your intent isn't but it's like uh it, it can just get really camouflaged and confusing and stuff so um that is like the trauma the trauma is like when you're born and you're a kid and you're like hey my legs don't work or I don't want to do something like no or whatever it is like do it do mm -hmm. it you're doing it and it's no excuses it's there's none of that so then as I got older and I figured out and once I left high school and I was like oh I'm autistic this is what's wrong with me like this is why I can't do these like things that normal people can do this is why I'm like all of these different uh, weird struggles I've had especially with friends and whatnot and the reason it was like no that's an excuse that's a crutch or whatever and it's like I don't even know what that what it, that's supposed to mean I have no idea what that's supposed to mean still but the trauma is that you're told that you're making excuses and you're gaslit like that because that same thing happened to them whenever they were a kid and so it, it's, it's generational, it's a cycle. And um, I broke out of it because I got to not have to work a nine to five. I, I broke out of it because I got on The Bachelor and I got to live my life the way I wanted to. So I got the time to explore my brain and what was going on inside of it. Whereas the rest of them are just constantly in survival mode, you know? Mm, yeah, makes total sense. And it's also like from a time where I don't know if this is just an American thing, but like uh, your children, I don't know when this started, but you didn't want anything to be wrong with your kids. Like the boomers, like the millennials, they say, how's it know? How's it feel to know you lost the game? Like for millennials, uh, like our parents, it's because of our parents, man. Like they didn't want anything to be wrong with their kids because of a survival thing at the time. Like, uh, you know, I don't know what the consequences were, whatever they were afraid of happening, if there was something quote unquote wrong with their kids, but it was some, some trauma thing for them. So um, the, no matter how many times I said, hey, I need help, hey, I need help, hey, I need help. Like it, the family's way of thinking that they're protecting you is a, a way of actually harming you. But it's not like I'm mad at them for that because I understand why they could think that. Uh, but I also know, hey, guys, we know better now. 
like, and it's okay. Like we, I'm going to uh, base everything on what we do now that we know better. Okay, that's really well explained. Thank you. How do people in your personal and professional uh, life generally take this whole PDA and even autistic thing? Um, how do they, uh, yeah, take that? And how do they deal with you slash respond to you? Um, perhaps when you're doing something that is quite quintessentially autistic in PDA, do you find that people are understanding or not, or a bit of a mix? Um, I, I think that anyone who I knew before my diagnosis is not understanding of it. And I probably don't really see them anymore. Like, uh, a lot of those friends and stuff, like I developed a very complex high level of masking. Like I masked my way onto a television show. Like I masked into being the favorite. Like I masked to get accepted and I am very good at initial acceptance always. Um, and then uh, usually I ruin it with people. But what happens is I'm not even like changing. I'm un like starting to unmask. So I become like less bubbly and maybe like a little more, I might get irritable by like, uh, you know, a lot of questions or a lot of people love to give me advice or try to give me unsolicited advice. And I, I think it just comes from being a nice, like sweet person who maybe is like a little bit too honest about her struggles and like people think they can help. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> uh, no, no way, no way. I'm literally just trying to vent. But I... Uh, I definitely spend a lot of time alone and I have people who I think personally are PDA themselves that I've been just like drawn to. And um, I think it's because subconsciously we co-regulate each other without realizing it as in, I know what I would need when I feel a certain way. So when I read that person and I think they're feeling that way, I can give them that autonomy. I can give them uh, whatever I can, I think that would help me. And the reason that I know like it feels different is because I can do that with some other people and I'm not helping them whatsoever. Uh, but whenever I do with certain people and they adapt to it so well, I'm like, wow. And then they provide the same thing for me whenever I need it. Um, and it's all like not even on purpose. And so those people, I kind of feel like are the ones that are like still left around, you know, out of all of the people that I knew, the ones who are who still uh, make me feel safe and who I must do the same for in some way, shape or form. Uh, yeah, yeah. They are friends. A lot of um, adults I know who are diagnosed in adulthood often report this kind of pattern of they find out they're autistic and they kind of come out and a lot of people uh, almost criticize them for being different or speaking different. Um, and they find that initially it could be quite isolating and I'm not necessarily speaking from experience here because I found out I was autistic when I was very young, very, mm -hmm. very young. Um, but a lot of adults I know report that I feel like I'm becoming lonelier. It's like, no, not necessarily. You're just more confident in yourself. You're more solid in your foundation. You're, uh, uh, you're now developing the confidence to be authentically you. And a lot of people who may have known you uh, whilst you are masking will begin to slip away because it's like that yeah, I'm not people pleasing for them yeah, yeah yeah exactly and so they slip away and then we start finding people who really really connect to us deeply so yes yeah it's an interesting evolution um yeah, yeah it is Oof. the next question was did you have an internalized presentation growing up or externalized but I guess you've kind of answered that now um would you say it's uh, more externalized now? I would say that I'm beginning to let myself externalize it more now. Like even today, because uh, I'm so rushed and I was at the mercy of 12 o'clock, you know? So yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. it's like killing me the whole time. So I'm trying to get dressed and my assistant's trying to help me. And I'm like trying on a shirt and I said, I need you to not make eye contact with me, please. I was like, I just, I can't, it's expecting something of me. Like even that, like uh, that's me at least being able to externalize it 
in some way as opposed to where I just internalize. Um, uh, I've internalized so much for so long in fear of the consequences of externalizing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also getting like less afraid and, le and realizing that like, it, what are people gonna do, yell at me? Like, guess what I can do? I can run away if I want. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Um, Demi and I were having a conversation yesterday about the word uh, manipulate um, oh, yeah. and how perhaps it's one of many words that needs uh, rehabilitating, like attention seeking, for example. Um, yes. Yeah, attention seekers are starved of acknowledgement. It's acknowledgement starvation. It's trying to meet a need. Same with manipulate. Oh. People often uh use the word manipulate as a slur but you were saying something very interesting about the word manipulate if you yeah yeah, yeah um i had to have a my own personal like rehabilitation with the word manipulate because i thought of it so negatively and i thought i could never be manipulative because manipulative people are just gross and mm, terrible so then i realized that <laughs> One day, I don't even remember how I came to this conclusion, but then I was like, wow, I'm a mass manipulator because again, I manipulated myself onto television. I manipulated myself into being a fan favorite and I didn't look at it as manipulation, but at first, but of course it was, but it was just subconscious good intent manipulation. So uh, manipulation can be a good thing. A survival skill is what it was for me then. A good intent, subconscious survival skill with manipulation um i think that it's used a lot for survival and i think that sometimes it well a lot of the time it's subconscious and it's just what people can do to get through it i don't know i personally am not i'm not the liar <laughs> i i don't lie but i know a lot of P pdaers that do lie and i totally get why because subconsciously like they are not even meaning to but uh, their survival, they have like a fear of someone's reaction to something. And so they like subconsciously like cut this corner and like tell this like little lie, like a manipulation to manipulate it to where they avoid a consequence, like in children, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's just like, uh, I don't know. I, no, no, I, I, no, I, no, it's fine. I get it. I get it. To, to me, um... I did write a post about it a couple of years ago now, and I describe it as a, a desperate need to meet an all-encompassing need. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like indicative of how bad things have got. I have exhausted every other possibility, and now I'm going to have to resort to this because there's no other way I can possibly slake this thirst. Uh, just to put a different kind of spin on it. I, I totally, I, I agree with that so much. And that's totally like how I felt about going on reality show is like, I needed to do it because I needed my independence. And I tried working so many different jobs and I kept screwing up at the jobs because of these explosions and, um, or meltdowns or like, what, you know, uh, no call, no shows or something. And so I was like, I, I was working amazingly, got employee of the month twice. I was putting myself through online school and I was living at home and I, I'd had it. I'd had it. And I said, I'm applying for these shows and we're going to see what happens because you know what? We're smarter, not harder. And then it happened for me. <laughs> and then I, I somehow like, I don't even know. Next thing I knew I was out here. And yeah. it, it happened so fast. And I, I, who's to say I didn't dimension hop, baby? Like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Touché. Um, have you had any major burnouts since discovering you were neurodivergent? Yes, I did. Um, in June, uh, it was repetitive accumulation, repetitive losses of autonomy, perceived losses of autonomy. Um, it was a lot of people really, really take advantage of me in the sense of, I believe people so fast. Like, even if I bust you for something, even if I'm like, hey, you said this and then blah, blah, blah. If you're like, 
yeah, but I meant blah, blah, blah. I would be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like, oh, my bad. Like, because I believe that much that people are good. Does that make sense? Yes. I, so I'm you, so do you refuse, do you refuse to believe? No, no, actually, yeah. So what is that? You want, you want to believe people are good. You do believe people are good. Uh, you don't want to think that people have bad in them. It, what it's is it? Like, I think, I think like, what would I do? It, what would I do? I would be doing that. Uh, that makes sense. Like I would be doing the good because like, there's not a bad bone in my body truly at the core. So I believe in the good because I know that, that, that I'm good. Like I totally, I also, like I, if I can't, if I can't see it to that level of bad, like if I know that I wouldn't do that level of bad, I, then, you know, then why would they, then surely there's been a mix up and I misunderstood. And I want to believe that the most just because I guess like maybe. Yeah. I Let's guess so. that is interesting to me. Maybe I want to believe that because also that's probably some more trauma. That's another trauma unlocked. Probably. Trauma and autism. I, huh? There's something autistic about it as well, isn't there? Uh, like uh, you think about what, you know, you, you wouldn't be that bad, you know, so how could any, yeah. anyone else, you know, that's. that's yeah. Kind of and it's like, who am I to accuse them of doing something that bad? Because surely they would never, because I would never yeah yeah and so uh i i get confused a lot i get confused and i get taken advantage of and people will just say they know they can count on me to buy their bs and so like that and i will get so frustrated and so confused and stuck and just like stay in this in this place um until i don't anymore until until i have a an explosion a meltdown whatever it may be and so it, this happened and then I got stuck after that and I even hit you up and I was like uh feeling like back to what you asked me earlier too like nobody understands this PDA thing that's around me I have people that are willing to and trying to but they still uh I feel like and it might be subconscious this uh this might be like as something that I'm putting on myself I mean uh like they maybe aren't like like they're thinking maybe that it gets a choice and I'm like just like you know kind of the same trauma from when you're younger of you're making excuses like mm. you know it's the same kind of trauma of like oh does anyone really believe me like if they believe me wouldn't they help me wouldn't they help me better but then it's like oh remember that's nobody's job to help you but then it's like I really have been trying to help people my whole existence, like to prevent people from feeling any of like these terrible negative ways that I felt like that's just been what I do. I'm allowed to ask for some help back. And that actually uh, segues nicely into another question. How easy, it, how easy is it to get support? It's not, there's not, there's no support. There is no support you are paying you're spending your own money on all of it like and also what 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 kind of support do you what is there what are your options like a therapist um no that's not always ideal <laughs> far from it because if they don't understand autism let alone pda yeah. then you're kind yeah. of fucked yeah so basically like i got a, a from my neuropsychologist she diagnosed me with uh autism and ptsd and i came back to her a few weeks later and said wow have you heard of pda <laughs> and she was like no let me look into it and then she hit me back up with a whole list of all kinds of information on pda and all kinds of stuff uh so that was incredible and validating like she was always so validating but just like you know, further validation like not only to hear what I said but to go and research it and be like wow thanks for telling me about this and I'm like thank you for giving me information on it but um then she also sent me a list of PDA friendly therapists and I've been through the list and most of them are super invalidating and super annoying they say this Oh yeah, yeah, I know, PDA profile, yeah, 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 it doesn't really matter, no, 
every time. It doesn't matter. Why would it not matter? It's every sorry, sorry, sorry. What doesn't matter? PDA, the PDA profile. They think that that doesn't matter. They're like, yeah, that's just like that. Just, they they act like that's not the most important and only only thing that matters about anything we're doing here, folks. Like if they understood it like I would, like there's no need for us to go through anything else. If you know the PDA profile, you know what's going on here. Like then then you would know how important this is. <laughs> <laughs> um so they just they try to downplay it but here's what they do it's because they probably google it and they read one counter article on it and then they go oh yeah. and that and then their minds my their minds made up <laughs> but then i talk to people who will say that and i'll sit there and i will eat till i'm blue in the face prove to them how pda like without being obvious about me proving it to them I'll set it up, you know, I'll set it up nice for them for then me to show how this is all back related to PDA. And so I've been teaching a lot of people a lot of stuff about it. So that's cool. But as far as support for myself. No, no, like it's. No, it's been really like the online community, like uh, people like you. Um, this woman on Instagram at Peace Parents. She's oh, yeah. the, oh my gosh, like that woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> That's good. And at least you have some. I love her. Some, I love her some, so much. Yeah, at least we can have some semblance of support in but, the people. But then I, I've hired my own support. So, like, um, I've hired neurodivergent women who right. want to help me and also who I want to help have jobs because being neurodivergent in this world it is not working in this world especially whenever they set us up sometimes like women they set us up with skills for what they want us to do not what we want to do like you think anyone ever taught me how to support myself no they taught me how to support someone else like how to cook and clean for someone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's really annoying but that's what I want to be like hey I want to be able to support women that way. Um, if they ever need to be independent, they can be, you know, like they don't, they don't need anyone but themselves. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I need. <laughs> yeah. So on perhaps a slightly more positive note with regards to my questions, have you had any kind of um, success stories where you have talked about PDA to someone uh, in the States I'm mostly interested in, and they have listened and they have researched and they have uh, validated you? And maybe even they've said, oh yeah, and I think maybe I am as well. Any stories like that? Well, the, my neuropsychologist was one, but not her herself thinking she has PDA, but her at least validating me and researching it. People yeah. in my life, I've had someone do it. Mm. And I feel like they might be PDA, but I also like, they're too, I don't know. That's a different story. I don't want to get into that. Um, I've had a lot of people that I have told, hey, you're PDA. They don't like it. They don't like it. Someone, one of them actually told me I was projecting my, my diagnosis. That my way, of, this is what they said, the way of me dealing with my diagnosis was me maybe feeling like everyone had it around me. And I was like, I don't think everyone around me has it. I think a specific few people that I notice the same pattern in and I notice I can talk to them and I can test it and it works. And I, I can, I've t like, I'm not just talking out of my butthole. Like I've done a lot of research and a lot of thinking prior to me ever speaking on it. So invalidating me of course but that's like I think the scary part of like trauma and undiagnosed unrecognized PDA too is like I think that the person can be in such survival mode that they have to invalidate others to prevent themselves from having meltdowns with yeah. and they don't they're not aware of this no 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 no, no. yeah absolutely I wondered how PDA friendly your life is now compared to perhaps a few months ago. It has, um, has learning about it and understanding it helped you to perhaps put in place uh, strategies and measures that are at least helping to keep your autonomy levels high. 
Is it getting yeah. better? Is it getting worse? Hopefully better. Um, I, I think it's definitely uh, getting better. It got worse before it got better. Mm. Um, I think it really comes down to like anybody who gives me the feeling and I know the feeling. If someone's repetitively giving me that feeling and like they are willing to listen to me whenever I say, hey, I know it's stupid. I know this is irrational to you. I know that this isn't going to make a lot of sense. I will make it make sense for you, but you're going to have to listen to me, you know, whatever. But like, I need you to not talk to me like that. Like you just can't, you just can't. And if they have any kind of problem with that, then, then you're not going to talk to me. You're never going to talk to me again. Like I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore because I remember that feeling and I've said it my entire life of like, I would be like, just please just stop talking to me like that. Like just stop talking to me like that. And I never knew what it was. And it's talking to me in an authoritative way, in a, in a way that it essentially uh, you're making me feel imbalanced with you. And um, I go to great lengths when I'm having conversations with people to make sure that they don't feel that way and like reading them the whole time because of how traumatized I am by feeling like that so much. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm kind of establishing it in my life with people who aren't going to make me feel that way, talk to me that way, but also know that who I am and they know who I am and my core and what I want is good. And that um, in moments of high distress, when I'm panicking, I'm not going to be polite. Like I'm not going to have manners, but I love you. And um, I need you to help me get back down. And once we get like that back down, then I'm going to be able to access my skills like gratitude and stuff like that and see, hey, thank you for staying with me through this moment. Um, and, you know, it builds trust and loyalty. I think that's quite profound, um, especially what you said about uh, it having nothing to do with lack of manners, right? Because a lot of our distress behaviors may uh, undermine or contradict um the basic moral principles of society right and I think that's extremely difficult for non-autistic people to understand but in my own experience um even in autistic and PDA friendships it's still very difficult for us to switch uh switch off or switch on uh, or remind ourselves that this isn't personal this person doesn't really uh, hate me or whatever, you know, this is just how their distress is manifesting in this moment, uh, even though it's quite difficult to cope with. Um, at least I know that I had to struggle with that growing up and exploding, you know, exploding and God, looking back, saying some horrible things, perhaps doing some horrible things. And just even though maintaining a high level of accountability and sorry and guilt and all of these things, just are secretly hoping that people can see through the monstrous yeah. outer layer and understand that, no, no, I'm hurting and I'm frightened underneath. The, uh, the monster that you see at the surface does not reflect my morals, does not reflect my character. You know, uh, that's a tough one to explain. Yes, I, I, I totally know. Oh, I know that feeling all too well. It's like I saw something that said, if being autistic feels like being an alien, then being PDA feels like being a space monster. And I was like, yes, absolutely. I've not heard that one, that's, that's good. Yeah, I was like, absolutely, it feels like that. Because <laughs> um, it's hard, like I kind of feel rejected by like the autistic community. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that ha see that happens. Um, I can remember saying a while back, um, good way to know if you're, a good indicator that you're PDA is that not only do we feel lost and like an alien in the neurotypical world, but we still feel just as weird and distant and separate in the autistic world as well. Um, yeah. Because of the marked difference in the way we engage with the world. Yes, um, I think, it's it's also too it's like how high um our masking is because of like our role play like uh before i know it demi the character on the bachelor just be i was just that you know and i that i was that all uh day and night so uh it's interesting how the masking just it can become you and i've seen it in people who i think of like undiagnosed unregulated unrecognized pda 
uh, of how you are so, so brainwashed in your mask, like, you know, just so delusional in it that uh, it's a survival mechanism. So I'm not faulting them for it, but I'm like, wow, like, I don't need, I don't know how to help. Wish I could. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, perhaps my next question uh, before I hand it over to the audience would be, and I like to ask a lot of neurodivergent people this, can you feel the difference between a PDA response and a trauma response? Because there are there is a body of opinion who uh, assert that PDA has to be a trauma response um, because perhaps a lot of PDA behaviors mirror trauma responses, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest that babies display PDA behavior long before anything traumatic happens to them. I suppose it gets into tricky territory because as neurodivergent people, we are perhaps traumatized by events that would be just trivialities to a lot of people, but we won't get into that debate mm -hmm. or slash discussion today. Um, but as a pda -er, as an autistic person, it's very clear when it's coming from my neurodivergence versus when it's coming from my trauma. I know it's trauma because that feeling is hideous. It's disgusting. It doesn't mean that it's not difficult when it's PDA, but there is something very distinctive about the trauma response. I can feel it. It's cold. Whereas there's more of a hotness to a neurodivergent response and there's more of a cold chilliness to a trauma response. That's wow. Yeah. I never, I never put a temperature to it, but that does. Yeah, I put temperature to it. Yeah. Cause I can feel this. I, how did I put this? I'm not good at remembering the stuff that I say. Uh huh. Yeah. Me either. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always good. Trauma feels like the cooling and the hollowing of the innards. It feels like it's cold and empty inside when it's a trauma response. Whereas when it's neurodivergence, there is a, and say perhaps, I can feel neurodivergent, overwhelm, PDA, overwhelm, meltdown, whatever. There's a fire to it, whereas there's an ice to the trauma. So that's the way I uh, experience it. I don't know whether you uh, have differentiated the two. You know, I definitely have, and I wrote it down somewhere. Um, I don't remember it right now, but I think that the like the reason I don't remember it is because uh, I was getting really obsessed with it. Uh, with di differentiating it because I was like, I can feel it now. I cannot, I, like this one's trauma, this one's PDA. And um, I was getting really like trying to get to the root of it. And so I asked someone, um, I, I'm not going to say their name just in case, but they said, it, why does it matter? Like that, I get asked that question all the time. It doesn't matter because either way, like you, you, rec you relate to PDA, you relate to all of this. This is the approaches that work. Then it's PDA. It doesn't matter, um, like for your own personal healing right now. And I was like, well, I can't argue with that. So I, I had to stop kind of like obsessing over it. But I think that for me, maybe um, the trauma, I've talked about this before too, is the trauma is like the PDA is like when you're a kid and you're, for me, like being forced to have to do things like that trauma of constantly having to do it and having to internalize my threat response the trauma now is like I feel when I can't be honest with someone about how I feel like but I also can like pressure myself to feel that like I need to talk about it and oh and be honest about it so then I'm like avoiding the demand of doing it uh you know so it can get really messy and muddled mm -hmm. so it's like all this time uh trying to figure out which one's which like I think my trauma honestly is validating myself like the lack of validation I had the lack of believing myself the gas internal gaslighting also I think that uh, just as uh, humans we can and PDAers we gaslight ourselves and we are gaslit constantly oh, yeah. so that that trauma um and like the feeling of that resurfacing is like uh, fawning, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. We definitely gaslight ourselves, that's for sure. Um, and suppress, invalidate ourselves, and ABA ourselves as well, right? Um, in a yeah, what do you say again? I keep... 
Oh, um, applied behavioral analysis. Yeah. Example. Which, so <laughs> it's a lot more prevalent in the States. Um, it is the uh, the malpractice of yeah. uh, imposing neuronormative standards on children with the hope that their more autistic behaviours uh, fall away uh, whilst a uh, kind of more neurotypical presentation is built in its place and therefore uh, a series of reward and punishment systems are used to uh, positively reinforce pro-social behaviours and uh, suppress uh, anti-social behaviours or behaviours that are just not necessarily welcomed or appreciated in polite society. So uh, giving eye contact, good thing, good thing, good thing. Um, reciprocal conversation, good thing. Not stimming, good thing, right? To us, it's a bad thing, obviously. Um, but it's the practice of uh, equipping the child with skills that are more consistent with um, societal values, whereas autistic, ex natural autistic ex expressions are not validated. Or it's ableism. It's ableism. Exactly, ableism. So my argument would be, when we're masking, we are essentially doing that to ourselves, right? Oh, and my we, gosh. We, inter we internalize an ABA practitioner. And every time we do something that may cause the mask to slip, we... Uh, internally chastise ourselves you know you fucking idiot what are you doing don't show people that you know um, and we practice perhaps even unconsciously uh, developing and honing the mask and this gets really complicated when perhaps lots of kids teens university students uh, employees of companies uh, will rush into places slash spaces that aren't autistic friendly because it's an opportunity to build the mask so lots of people on the outside will mistake that as hey look that kid likes going to school that person loves their job no no, no. Yeah. they are uh, moving rapidly into these environments because they can practice being someone else while suppressing themselves so by the time it gets to that point it's really fucked wow yeah wow yeah oh my gosh so very interesting too about the the saying that uh, the self gaslighting and the like whenever you fail to do something neurotypical or whatever and you're like ah like you idiot you slipped up like they're gonna know um that feeling it I've seen it in my trauma like it gets manifested into the people closest to you so if somebody does something that is weird or uh, like a, a kid doing this number and that your child's doing that, you're gonna say, stop, what are you doing? You And then you're re now you're teaching that kid uh, like rejection sensitive dysphoria in a yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose the tricky part is we learn through direct experience and we touched on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivators yesterday. And there can be an intrinsic motive to mask. And we know this because for a lot of us, masking is not demanding, even though it should be, because that shit zaps the living hell out of us, but we still do it. So making an effort, uh, sorry, effort itself is not inherently demanding because we make effort to avoid demands and we make effort to mask. Why is masking not demanding? Why is masking not demanding? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We know it's bad for us. We know it destroys us. We know that it depletes us, but we do it because there is an intrinsic motive to do it because once upon a time, we had a direct experience of it's not okay to be me as I am. And now I will build a new self fit for the world. So yeah it's all yeah. right yeah. and it takes a long time to untangle and it's not as easy as just unmasking uh because we don't choose to mask when those horrible it's early survival it's survival it happens so you can't unmask any more than you can mask you have to have sufficient proof that it's safe and if it's mm. not safe out there the mask stays in place absolutely and uh it's so frustrating people will tell you or will tell me like um, you can unmask around me. You can do that. You can be yourself. Get mad at me. It's fine. Blah, blah. And I'm like, 
you don't understand. Like, it doesn't work like that. Like, what's going to happen in a moment of distress? I'm going to test you and I'm going to see what you're going to do and how you're going to react. And that is when it matters. You can tell me all day long about how I can be these ways to you. It doesn't matter. It's the moment in distress, what you're going to do in that moment. And if you aren't ready for it in that moment and you fail me, then I will forever mask with you. Like you blew it until you can somehow prove it to me in another time that otherwise. Uh, but my brain remembers. And it's also, I always say like, it's my consciousness. This is like the vessel, you know, that my consciousness is experiencing it through. And I cannot control these perceived threats and what it does. And I will make up all kinds of reasons for why I'm doing everything. But at the end of the day, guys, we can see that it is clearly autonomy loss of here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh man, right. It doesn't, that doesn't change. Like that's still it. Like whatever reasons we come up with. Um, and like you were saying about lack of effort, like I will go through so much effort to uh, like something I don't want to talk about, about like not showering. I will go through so much effort to make sure no one can tell I didn't shower that I could have yeah. just showered in that time very easily. Yeah. Uh, so, but it's like, you know, it's just, I, that ask, I, feel I ask people to try an experiment with not framing demand avoidance as a negative, right? Uh, the very phrase, demand avoidance suggests it is a negative or a regressive move. And I say, no, 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 it's a positive move in that we're moving towards something. As we move away from the demand, we're moving towards something else, which is why we can make a hell of a lot of effort to not shower. We can make a hell of a lot of effort to not go to work, a hell of a lot of effort to not do all of these things. It requires a lot of self-discipline because we're always moving towards autonomy so so long as we're moving towards autonomy we can make effort we can be self-disciplined these things can happen it's just that the things we're avoiding are held in such high regard by most people um so that's difficult for me to explain why because people often say how did you arrive at this venue harry how are you giving a talk harry and i say no i didn't it, it wasn't like that i it fell, wasn't like that thank you i, I fell i fell i fell on I fell onto this stage and the words were falling out of my mouth as effortlessly as when your children escape from school to sit on the couch and play their video games. You know, they escaped from school. That took a lot of effort. That took a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, reasoning power and quick thinking. But because they moved away from school, we, we regard it as demand avoidance. But I say, no, they're moving towards something as well. So when we move towards areas of autonomy or in which autonomy thrives, yeah, that's cool. It's possible. It's just that yeah. where we want to go is where perhaps society doesn't want us to go. And it's framed as a negative. For sure. They definitely don't want us to go there. Yeah. And but even even ourselves, we're like, no, I kind of need to shower. Like we, we play these mind games with us. It's like, yes, you do need to shower, but you're not going to shower in that way. So we're going to move you away from the shower because that's just PDA's way of saying, not like that, not like that. No, yeah. don't go, don't have a shower like that. Do it like this instead. You know, <laughs> I, I won't demonstrate, but you get the picture. Um, yeah. Right. So yes, everyone, I can see your comments and questions here. Um, she's speaking like my American woman life. You're making excuses. Legit is what I heard the most. Um, what advice would Demi give to her parents raising her with the knowledge she has about herself now? Are we going to answer that? Yeah. Um, I don't, I, you know, I really, I don't fault them because they didn't know better. Um, but I would say that to just stop, like, I would just say to do everything completely differently. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would say to, uh, like, let me do what, whatever I was drawn to doing and encourage me every step of the way and to know that I'm not bad and there was no malicious bone ever in my body. Mm -hmm. Like, to know and believe that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good answer. That's fair enough. I loved your idea, Sam says, of asking your friend for a fart to break the tension of that expectation. I've been trying to do this when I feel that same tension. Do you have any other things that you have found that work in helping yourself out when hanging out with friends? 
Um, you know, I'm like kind of, I'm kind of like newer to having like being open to with my friends. Like I, I kind of isolated myself a lot through all of this journey, but like the people who know who are still in my life and stuff are like the new friends that I've made. Um, if, if I'm hanging out with them, uh, and if I can't go to, if, if I don't know if I'm safe, like talking about like safe is in like nervous system. If I, I, my nervous system knows, like it will avoid things because it's avoiding the activation. So if I know that I'm not safe with them, then I'm not going to bring it up. And I'm probably, if I'm hanging out with them, I'm going to need to go ahead and go home now. It's time for me to remove myself or else I will end up doing something I don't want to do to the friendship or, you know, my nervous system will pay for it. So the people who I do feel like I can communicate it with, I will talk about it. And if it goes awry and we keep talking about it and I'm like, hey, just so you know, like you can feel free to keep talking to me authoritatively, but just so you know, every time you do, I will respond with F you or worse. Like who knows what's going to come out of my mouth, but we can both laugh about it after, but like, that's how, that's just what's going to happen. Like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to just like, let that go. Like, no, I can't take it. <laughs> and, um, and we, we thrive, like we can do it. We can argue it out. We can, uh, have those little moments of like testing each other or whatever, like, you know, and I'll, my friends who I believe are PDA, like they will, in, in times where they're having distress and I'm at a point where my window of tolerance is greater, like I can take it. Um, I can tell them like, hey, I'm not, I'm not gonna leave you, dude. I'm not gonna go anywhere. You can say whatever you want to me right now. And then they will see, they, they realize that I mean that. And then they'll give me that in return too. So we're like building trust within each other. Uh, and again, like I'm new to this. So long-term, who knows, man, I could be blowing it all. I think you're doing a great job. Did your parents ever use the word stubborn with you? And not until I got into middle school and high school, I think that they would probably say I was stubborn when it came to not wanting to go to church, not wanting to go to school, not want or wanting to go hang out with my friends that they did not want me to hang out with and stuff. Um, I, I was very uh, obedient as a child, passive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you mentioned that earlier. Uh, don't worry, Harry and Laura will be over in the US soon to educate everyone. Oh, and Demi's going to join us in California. So that's going to be awesome. We're really excited about that. Uh, yeah. 5th of November, Orange County, somewhere. I can't remember. But yeah. <laughs> uh, lots of comments, especially when teaching manners to kids, fitting in with the wealthier kids in order to get ahead socially. Yeah, it's, you know... I always switch off when people talk about social skills and people say, yeah, but surely it's good to have social skills. I'm like, yeah, but it's like when people oh say- Oh my gosh, that's what they were doing. I never realized that. No, well, it's like when people say, I want my kid to reach their full potential. And I, I don't see that as a good thing. And people say, oh, stop being such a pessimist. You know, I'm like, no, no, I'm not. The problem is if you want them to reach their potential by your standards, that's bad. Because maybe you want them to- carve a path towards a more non-autistic non-pda form of success it's like social skills it's like yes i'm not advocating that we um club people over the head with a guitar i'm saying that we need to think about what it means social skills right um i struggle with terms like polite and rude right i think these are largely socially constructed oh and yeah I, hopefully, I, I, and hopefully I determined so like I grew up hating using knives and forks. I instinctively reach for food with my fingers. And now I eat at a lot of uh, East African and Middle Eastern cuisines where they literally just do that. And it's not rude. And I'm not rude when I go into those restaurants, whereas I was rude growing up, right? So a lot of these things are culturally determined and have no use or meaning or relevance really to autistic culture. And so, yeah, rudeness perhaps 
I get it. People can be assholes. People can intend to harm. But being rude because you don't look at someone in the eye or because you utter a cutting makes no sense statement. It's a tricky it, one. It takes, social, social it, skills, it, does, it takes intent and it, it throws it out the window. It, it gives no value to any intent of what you're doing. It, it It's so dumb. Like if you perform these little acts in this way at these times in a conversation or in a, at a point in an interact interacting interacting whatever um then then you will be considered polite quote unquote like you have good intent essentially but if you don't do it then yeah. you are rude then you are not only you don't have good intent you have bad intent you meant to sabotage it like it doesn't make sense and also yeah. we're just not we're, we're that is a waste of time it is a waste of time. That's the thing. And much of even the word unfriendly. Um, my mother used the word unfriendly to describe someone the other day. And I said, what do you mean by that? Because that word doesn't mean anything in the autistic world because we're so used to people who don't want to be around human beings. And I'm like, that sounds like a great person. If they're unfriendly, sign me up. Um, yes. <laughs> So these uh, polite, rude social skills. What does it mean? Social skills. Oh, taking turns in conversations like, look, most of my friends are ADHD. We interrupt each other constantly. And yeah, it can get annoying, but it's just a fact of life. You know, someone's got to interrupt us, otherwise we'll keep going. So it's kind of welcome interruptions, whereas interruptions might be seen as something that's rude outside of this community. No, we will monologue indefinitely ad infinitum if something doesn't stop us. So interrupt me if I go on too long. So it's 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 relative is what I guess what we're saying so people say social skills but why because they don't make friends but if you equip them with social skills and they make friends through their mask they're not really making friends so exactly you know exactly wow wow it's all a scam <laughs> yeah yeah it is it is a scam it is a scam I know and it's this is all where, just like yeah. a miss like it, there's so many things that uh I have realized are like that is that they are like covered up like uh it, it's not what it seems like as far as um like exactly what you're saying is that you that you think about it in this way and it's like oh, well I never thought about it whenever you break it down like that doesn't make any sense no. I mean no I know um here's another question uh, did your PDA come out when you were on the bachelor or did you find yourself masking well it, I didn't know I had PDA then. Like, uh, I didn't know anything. I didn't know PDA was a thing. I knew that there was something, but it definitely, it, it's actually really funny. Um, you can see in, it's in Bachelor in Paradise 7, the latest one I did. Um, like, you know, threatening language, key characteristic, a lot of explosive behavior. So I was about to I not get, um, I just got there. I'd been there like two days and I wasn't going to get a rose at the rose ceremony. And I, so me having to leave, like, first of all, my, I don't have autonomy. My life is in the hands of these producers and the show. And if they are going to keep me or not. And at this point, I'm a whiskey puke and alky. I would love, I need to stay because I don't want to go back home and what go like do nothing. Like I'm, I'm having fun here. Mm. So I'm doing an interview and I'm like, if I don't get a rose tonight, I will literally light this place on fire. Mm. <laughs> and I said it multiple times and I was so serious. I was so serious. Yeah. So uh, like little moments like that, but really, if you just watch the whole thing, I could explain my behavior, like step by step, every, everything I did the whole way and be like, I can understand why this happened. This happened because like this reason, like, um, and how it's all, I mean, everything I do is PDA. Mm. Yeah. Of course. Everything's PDA. But even when we're masking, even when we're, you know, and I was talking to someone the other day about how there's still something very authentic about masking at its core. I, we have made I was not aware of this masking when I did The Bachelor. Like all my post interviews, I'm like, yeah, that was just me because that was just me. Because in that moment, that, uh, that mask was authentic because that was my survival. I didn't choose to do it. It wasn't like I said, oh, I'm going to act uh, like, well, maybe I would say that sometimes. I would be like, okay, I'm going to act unbothered because that's my way of dealing with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it just, it wasn't conscious. Like it wasn't, maybe cognitive is the right word. 
like uh, it's probably yeah. not <laughs> it's it sounds like i want it to be the right word it is cognitive it's not maybe cognitive. cautious i, I suppose cautious. So. hyper vigilant or yeah um, a cautious cautious cognitive cautious cognition uh something like i don't that. know what we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to find a word um one of those words will be fine. I'm sure people understand. Um, question for you both. Do you also struggle with explanations for how you reacted to a situation being taken as an excuse by others? And what do you do to prevent that? Oh, right. So you can't prevent that. They're going to do that. What you can do is, is stop explaining let, yourself and say, see ya. Let's reverse it for a moment. If I feel slighted or hurt, I don't mind if people justify themselves. I don't mind if people explain themselves because I, I want to know. I want to know. I don't I don't want to say no excuse for what you did. No, tell me, right? Tell me, tell me what happened. Uh, you know, we can have a converse, we can have a very, very productive and purposeful conversation. I re I I don't mind it at all. If I feel hurt, uh, and you know, people say sorry, and it's always like, oh, don't worry, you know. But here's the thing: Would you ever demand someone explain themselves? No, to no, you? no, 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 no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't demand yeah. it. Um. Oh, sorry. I feel like. Well, I'm just saying that uh, the person. I don't know. I can't see this comment or this question. But what I'm wondering is, like, they're saying they're having to explain their behavior, and so I'm wondering if someone's demanding them to have to explain their behavior because. Uh, once someone's demanding you to have to explain your behavior, then like you know that that person, you're not even, you're wasting your time if you're trying to genuinely explain yourself because it's not like you'd be explaining yourself to someone like you. You'd be explaining yourself to someone who would be demanding you to explain yourself to them. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I guess I, it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I, even though I am fully prepared to be accountable, I s grew up, desperate for people to understand where this was all coming from and that I wasn't just misbehaving or yeah yeah or it's, like, or it's like people it's like it's a it's got it's a weird hobby if you think this is just purely deliberate this is a very weird weird <gasps> you no know, like why would people I really think this about me like yeah. they, people in the United States think that I am trying to come up with any excuse uh for either attention or to excuse my who i my behavior or whatever and i'm like i didn't think my behavior was all that bad but I, then again i understand my reasoning behind it all yeah yeah and i also talk a lot about how there's no such thing as an overreaction there's just reactions right so it's only an overreaction relative to someone else's experience um if we are melting down because we can't deal with the uh, sensory environment we're not overreacting to those noises it's an, it, the bodily response demonstrates that that's just how I'm responding, right? And I guess it can become a little more complex in interpersonal situations. Um, but still, it's very useful to know because otherwise people who aren't familiar with autistic and PDA experience will say, oh, it just popped out of nowhere. You know, like lots of teachers say that about uh, neurodivergent students. They had a meltdown for no reason. We didn't even do anything. It's like, no fuck you, you have to look into that more, right? Because yeah. you're downplaying their experience. And, and so this is where it comes from. It's like, yes, I get it. I'm sorry, really, I feel guilty and awful. But yeah, I, 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 I secretly want people to understand where it's coming from. And therefore, I afford them the same. If, I, if, it's, if the roles are reversed, I don't mind it if they explain themselves. And I will never say that's an excuse because even the concept of excuse making to me is vague. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would never do it. I know how painful it is to be told that. Um, so if the person is, if the person is non-receptive to you explaining yourself, then it's one of like the craziest things is like, I don't know if this is an American thing. I don't know if this is a woman thing. I don't know if this is a, uh, I don't know. But no. that you are so like gaslit about your feelings and your experiences and why you do things that you take, ex you accept behavior from people who uh, suck and you think that you're the one that sucks because 
they're telling you they suck and you don't realize that they're the actual one because you're listening to them and believing them like we were saying earlier about like I'm good so why wouldn't they be the same so like you get stuck in that for so long that that traumatizes you to where you feel like uh to where you get stuck in situations again where you're having to explain yourself to somebody and they're gonna say stuff like that's excuses like you're in another situation that you got to get away from that person if anyone's gonna say you're giving excuses you literally have to find someone else in your life because those those people are never going to change. Like I've tried with those, I've tried, I've tried, I've yeah, tried that, to change people's minds. I'm glad that you brought that up actually, because the reason, my own reasoning that I explained to you earlier needs to be uh, modulated in the, yeah, you can end up applying it to people who perhaps can't change because their trauma is that deep. And, you know, it's, you, you end up just, wasting your energy wasting your time and damaging yourself further uh it's a case by case thing I suppose yeah um, it's really it's hard though because like I felt like I never believed that and I kept like thinking it was it was on me and I I kept like staying in these like not even like relationships but just like people who I was supposed to love people mm -hmm. I was supposed to love mm -hmm. and so it felt like I was wrong for so long and it was like I promise anyone who's watching listening whatever there are people out there who are not going to make you question yourself or make you uh, tell you excuses or any of that stuff. Like there's, there's people out there that will uh, believe you. Mm, wonderful. Okay. Let's have a look. See, that's the thing. Man. There's like a whole group of people. Like I think it's particularly women and girls here that like struggle to just be believed mm -hmm. because how, how could we know better? That's what, how could we know better? Like, we're just, we're taught from the, we're a young age, we're dumb blondes. Like, thank God you're pretty. <laughs> All of this stuff, like, it's just a toxic culture. That's very toxic indeed. Whew. Right. Okay, then. I guess that's a good place to wrap it up. Demi, <laughs> thank you for joining me. Uh, Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Everyone loved it. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in this evening. Um, and thank you everyone who asked questions. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap the live up now. Uh, Demi, could you hang on just a moment? I'm gonna stop the live stream. Bye everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye.